Well, love for this is George G, and the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful Mac Cummings. Mac, are you ready to do this? I'm ready. All right, let's go. Mac is the co-founder and CEO of Terakeet. They are the largest pure SEO company in the United States and the founders of a new category called Owned Asset Optimization, as well as Reputation Management. Mac, excited to have you on. Tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about the personal life, a little bit about the work. Give us the why. So uh, personal life, I'm a son to Martha and Larry Cummings. I grew up in a small farm town called Tully, New York. That's not far from where I'm sitting right now in Skinny Atlas, New York. I uh, got married at 35 years old to my wife, Rochelle. I have three little kids, one of which just celebrated her fourth birthday on Sunday. I've got also a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Uh, we made a big move down to Palm Beach, Florida uh, last fall to put our kids in school there, but we still get to spend summers here in upstate New York, which is uh, our favorite place in the world. We, uh, <clears throat> we uh, started our company not far from here at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, which is where I went to college and around my sophomore year decided out of Cascadilla Hall at Cornell that I should start a company. And I was so naive to think that that would work. <laughs> and uh, and so that was really the start of it. It was in Ithaca, New York in 1999 that I started this company that still kind of exists today, although the name has changed a couple of times. Started the company in 1999 starry-eyed opt or optimist enthusiasm and it turns out it actually worked yeah it's a 25 year overnight success story as they say um it was uh it was really out of necessity that we started the company we were just trying to figure out a way to make money i know founders often have these uh stories that they tell of you know something happened and my car broke down on the side of the road and I decided to start this, you know, online insurance company or something like that. I wish that that was the case, but really we just were so naive that we thought that we could start something at that age. And we did, and we kept trying and, uh, and 25 years later, here we are. And was it in the, in the, the internet search space? Yeah, actually it was. So the first business that we started was called the Money Crawler. And it was a search engine, believe it or not, in the financial space where you could type in the name of a stock or a ticker symbol. And we would very quickly return a series of articles that had been recently published about that company. And we thought it was quite useful. We got a bunch of traffic to the website, but it was the wild, wild west of the internet very difficult to monetize traffic. We were trying to sell banner ads and we just had a really tough time figuring out how to make money. And we were trying to pay our way through college. So we had to make money <laughs> or we were gonna be in real trouble. So we very quickly pivoted to software and consulting. And around that time, there was an ecosystem up at Cornell of startups that were venture backed that were starting businesses. And we kind of decided that if we sold the pick, you know, the, the, the shovels and, um, and, and the tools to those entrepreneurs, we could make money because we could charge a retainer or we could charge a project fee. So that was the first business that we built at Cornell that was doing that called Mindshark software and consulting. And that was the business that we ran through college and used to pay our way through college. And it was pretty successful. But by the time we graduated, we wanted to start something bigger and something that had more of a recurring revenue function to it. And that was when we launched Terakeet, which is the business that we run today in 2001. And the premise of Terakeet was actually built off of the original idea for Money Crawler, which was that people were looking for information uh, online, but that that was going to migrate to this idea of voice search. And uh, we got really interested in voice recognition and speech recognition. 
And that's where we came up with Terakeet. The name actually was based on parakeet and terabytes taking data and answering people's questions. And it failed miserably. <laughs> we, uh, we spent about two years building a product that no one wanted. And we took that product out to market and no one bought it. But thankfully, the original company that got us into that business, that was a voiceover IP company said, hey, could you help us drive more traffic to our website? And things came full circle to working with that company to try to rank various terms on Google so that we could drive customers to their website. And in 2003, that really became the basis for what is the modern day Terakeet. You were just uh, 20 years too uh, soon on the voice stuff. I went to a conference <laughs> uh, out in San Francisco, I think in probably 2002, 2003, and they had a bunch of experts from all around the world that were working on speech recognition, some of which had been working on it since 1960 at Bell Labs. And someone from Microsoft got up in front of all of us and said, uh, by show of hands, when will voice recognition in a call center be as accurate as a human? And I raised my hand and said, 2010, someone else said 2020. And then he put up the screen the year 2050. And I kind of turned to my partner and I said, Pat, we don't have this kind of time. <laughs> we got to figure, we got to figure something else out. So there we were back to um, pivoting again and, and trying to uh, figure out what was next. Back then we called it going out of business. Um, now entrepreneurs call it pivoting, which is essentially shutting down what you're doing and then doing something else. That's, that, that's, that's really funny. It's, we need a bigger boat moment. <clears throat> All right. So from humble beginnings, and now you are a, a very large company, lots of employees, and but you've done it differently. Yeah. So what we always learned about in school when we were studying business is that you have to build a business plan, you have to build a pitch deck, and then you have to go out and you have to pitch a bunch of investors. So that's actually what we thought we had to do. So that's what we did. And um, we went out and we raised about $400,000 from my grandmother, from a guy who uh, I had worked for his company, a college roommate's father. And we tried for two years to raise money and it was our entire fixation. And what ultimately ended up happening was we raised money too soon we built a product that no one wanted and we went through their money and ran out of it when really what we should have done is just grinded and tried to find customers and, um, and, and built a product based on what the customers told us they wanted, which is what we ultimately did. So when we had the opportunity to try to rethink Terakey, we had had a customer that had held back payment on us for uh, a couple of years due to uh, some litigation that they were going through. And we knew that a big payment was coming in that we kind of didn't expect. And we used that as an opportunity to go back to our original investors and say, hey, Terakeet, as we knew um, and as we planned, is it, pretty much gone. And the business that you invested in doesn't exist. Would you be interested in being bought out? And so every single uh, original investor a few years later opted to... Um, get bought out at a premium to their original investment, which they were quite happy with because they thought we had gone out of business. In reality, we just felt so guilty about the idea that we had their money in the company that we never bankrupted the company and shut it down. We just kept going with Terakey. And we decided kind of from that point forward that the real way to build this business was to answer to ourselves, to build something that didn't have misaligned interest, didn't have the pressures of time and returns, and to do it in a bootstrapped way. And um, and that turned out to be one of the best decisions that we've ever made because there are probably a lot of moments where we were in you know, financial stress or we were wanting to do something big that was rather crazy where if we were answering to a board of people or 
a, a different group of people that had an interest in getting a return within a certain period of time, we never would have been given the leeway to do some of the things that we've done. I appreciate that. So having all your interests aligned, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense to me. Is that something that now looking back on, do you think that that is a viable model for businesses who are starting out today? Yeah, what I would tell young entrepreneurs that are thinking about building a business or building a company is that whatever you imagine in your head that you and a team of people are going to build will change quite dramatically from the time that you come up with an idea to the time that a customer or a series of customers actually purchases what it is that you've built. And so when a young entrepreneur comes to me and they show me a pitch deck of an idea that they're thinking of, typically they're asking for an investment. And what I tell them is imagine that this will change five, six, seven, or eight times. Imagine the name of the company might change. Imagine the product that you think that you're building will change dramatically. And imagine that most of the money that you invest to figure this out will probably be gone by the time you come to that realization and you're probably going to need more money. Would you rather raise money now at a low valuation to figure all those things out and essentially uh, learn an expensive lesson? Or would it be better with a smaller team to tinker, to talk to customers, to take a little longer, to take the time to figure out whether the dogs like the dog food, so to speak, and then build something that the market wants and then go out when you have a viable product, you have actual customers, you have revenue coming in and then make the, you know, it's kind of like in basketball, the, the pivot position, like you can not raise money, you can raise money, you could take a bank loan, you know, you have a lot of optionality at that point. Uh, it's not that there's anything wrong with raising money, but the way that I've described it is it's like fuel on a fire. If you just have a little spark, which is an idea, and you begin pouring gasoline on it, like that spark is going to go out. If you have a spark and a fire is starting very quickly, like you're on to the next Uber or Airbnb or something like that, um, and you know it and time is of the essence, then certainly those types of businesses require uh, injections of capital. That makes a ton of sense. It's a great metaphor. Just having the spark is not necessarily the next step should not necessarily be dump a bunch of gasoline on it because you could just put your idea out. Yeah. And the other thing about ideas are that all of them are good until you begin to scrutinize them heavily. And the ideas that tend to be thought of as the best are the ideas that often we know the least about. And when you start peeling back the onion and understanding the realities of the business that you're getting into, the simplicity of the business begins to get stripped away and the complexities and realities of what you need to create to satisfy a market need begins to rear its ugly head. And all of that takes time. And the less you know about an industry or a technology, the more at risk you are of iterating so many times that you <laughs> give up. And so the other thing that I encourage entrepreneurs to do is to get involved in businesses where rather than try to be, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide, you know, you're an inch wide and a mile deep and you become the expert and the specialist in that one thing that you do. And the more you know about a business going into it, the quicker you're going to get to market and the quicker you're going to get to revenue and customers, the less you know, the more you're going to stumble. And that's okay. I mean, there are plenty of people that have gotten into businesses where they are learning very quickly and they question also the status quo because why are things the way that they are you know, that's how Elon Musk has really been so successful. He's come into very traditional um, industries with embedded companies. And he said, why are they doing the things this way? Why are they building cars 
with this technology? Why are they building rockets that have to be the exact size of a railroad when you can just build the facility next to where the rockets take off and so on and so forth? Um, but not every entrepreneur is Elon Musk and has that level of intelligence. And, uh, and, and for most of us, we have to find something that we can learn a lot about, be really good at it and try to be the best in that one thing. Well, that's really well said. So there's certainly a time for urgency if you are Uber and trying to be first to market for, do you think that that's less common? I think that if you just look at the statistics, the number of people that raise venture capital and then extrapolating out to the number of companies that actually become large public companies, it's a very small percentage chance. But I think if you look at the number of entrepreneurs that have started a company without raising venture capital, that have iterated, that have bootstrapped, that have built something, there have been some great companies that have been built that way that are less talked about. Um, because if you just think about how the press is controlled, there's venture capitalists, private equity firms, they have PR firms, lobbying firms, they're pushing out press releases, they're talking about their investments, they're talking about their returns. But the little known fact is there are a lot of amazing companies that are out there that have never raised a drop of venture capital that most of us have never heard about. Um, but I think if I had a choice or I was advising someone how to build a company, that's where I would start. And I think what I would say is you can always raise money if you're building a great company. The first question you get asked if you go in front of a panel and you're trying to raise money or you're doing like a roadshow is, you know, what's your exit strategy? And I've never had an answer for that. The answer that I say is, build a fundamentally good company, build a company that has a great culture, that generates revenue, that has profits, which most people aren't familiar with. Uh, and, and then figure out what you're going to do and figure out what the best, most opportunistic way to grow is. And you can grow through acquiring other companies. You can grow by being acquired by another company. You can grow by raising private equity or venture capital, or you can grow organically by trying to add customers and add revenue and adding people in the process, which is what we've done. I love that. What's your exit strategy? Well, I'm going to build a fundamentally good company that's profitable and <laughs> it's sustainable and, and we're going to be mindful about how we're doing it and make sure that it's aligned with our values. Yeah, what, sounds, a novel, what a novel concept. It's, it sounds pretty correct. <laughs> one of the um, one of the things kind of when I did the pre-read for this interview were questions around um, building and why and with who and, and things like that. And I was reflecting on that a little bit. And a question that I think entrepreneurs can ask themselves if they're building something or they're thinking about building something or anyone really going into a job or a career or business comes down to this poem that I read and I heard quoted one time called a builder or a wrecker. And the poem from Charles Franklin Benvegar talks about, am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by rule and square? Am I shaping my work to a well-made plan patiently doing the best I can? Or am I a wrecker who walks to town, content with the labor of tearing down? Oh Lord, let my life be and my labors be that which will build for eternity. And I think when I thought about Terakeet and reflected back on Terakeet, we chose to be builders. And what that means is that we wanna build things for our customers that make our customers more successful. We wanna build things for our employees that give our employees a platform so that they can do something in our company that they can't do anywhere else in the world so that they have great skills that benefit us if they stay here, but also that benefit themselves and maybe the next company they go to if they decide to move on and become an alumni of Turkey and then building in our community. And the fact that, you know, we started this company in Syracuse, New York, not Silicon Valley or New York City, you know, we chose 
when we were 19 years old, my business partner, Pat and I, that we were going to be builders and we weren't going to be wreckers. It's not to say that there isn't a purpose for the wreckers, but I think as entrepreneurs, we show, we, we choose to be builders and, um, it's a good poem to read if, if your audience is interested. I love it. <clears throat> I love it. It is, a. Uh... how did you come upon the poem? I actually read a news article and there was a politician that was reflecting back on their time in Congress and described their time as being a builder versus a wrecker. I think a lot of times we tend to think of politicians as being wreckers. And uh, he referenced the poem and, and I looked it up. Another poem that resonated with me and I think would resonate with anyone who's building a company or has been through the trials and tribulations of entrepreneurship is just the, the concept that entrepreneurship often looks like a straight line, like from beginning to success. And it's everything but that. It's ups and downs and incredibly challenging and incredibly hard. And there's a poem called If by Rudyard Kipling. And in that poem, there's a section that says, if you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. And I read that and I thought to myself, well, why would triumph or disaster be an imposter? And the reality is that those two things are just moments in time. And the longer you dwell on your triumphs, the more you become egotistical and begin reflecting on the past and how great you are. And that can be a pretty miserable place to be, <laughs> particularly people that like sell their companies and have the big celebration and rent a big yacht and then ask themselves, can I just go back to what I was doing? Or people that have a major failure or a, what they refer to as a disaster and they blame someone or something and they kind of live out their days blaming their problems and everything on something else or someone else or this awful thing that happened. And that's a pretty miserable place to dwell as well. So what are we really doing, you know, as human beings and entrepreneurs? And the way that I think about it is this idea, of course, of building, but also the human fabric is the fabric of evolution and getting a little bit better every day, the idea of improvement. And I think we're all chasing excellence, but the thing that gets us up in the morning and the thing that keeps us going is constantly improving. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs imagine, back to the thing I raised earlier around exit strategy, they imagine this one day with the big celebration where they get liquidity and they exit a business, but that triumph is fleeting. And I think it's important for all of us to think about what gets us up in the morning, I know you're up early in Phoenix doing this, but um, but every interview that you do and and everything that you publish uh, gives you an opportunity to learn something. And for me, waking up every day and being around an amazing group of people at Terakey and working with my co-founder who's brilliant and getting to try to be a better dad and a better husband all those things are what keep me going and keep me feeling alive. And so this idea of triumph and disaster being imposters was very impactful for me. Agreed. I love it. Well, Mac, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? How can they engage with you? Uh, so pretty sure my email is on the website, terakeet.com. You can engage with me on LinkedIn. I'll respond to anybody who has any questions or any advice for me. And uh, I really appreciate you having me on today and uh, appreciate your time and keep doing what you're doing because uh, everything that you're putting out there gives people a chance to learn and get a little better, which is again, what we're all here to do. Amen. 
Well, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, show me your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Go to terakeet.com. It's T-E-R-A-K-E-E-T.com. Check out everything that Mac has built and is working on there. You can find him on LinkedIn and also check out a builder or a wrecker, as well as if the two poems that Mac referenced, and I will link those in the notes of the show as well. Thanks again, Mac. Thank you. And until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best.